You're listening to Sounds Good on BBC Radio London, 206 in the medium wave and 94.9 VHF. In just a moment, we're going to be talking to Keith Barker uh, about quadraphony. But, first of all, we're joined by John Longdon. Good evening, John. We're joined in the studio now by Keith Barker. Good evening, Keith. Hello, Dave. Thanks very much for travelling down to London to be with us today. And we're going to be talking about quadraphonics. Uh, and I'll say straight away, it's a subject that I don't know an awful lot about. So we're hoping that Keith's going to be able to explain all the intricacies of it to us. Um, this morning, though, I was fortunate enough to be invited by Martin Gilbert, who works for one of the uh, big um, hi-fi stores in London, to go to his flat and listen to some quadrophony. I must admit, it's the first time I've heard any. Um, my immediate impressions was how, how wonderful and, and how good and how realistic it sounded. But I was amazed at the amount of equipment which is involved in reproducing it. Um, we, we've had stereo with us for some time now. I think it was 1958, really, when stereo got onto the market in any commercial form. But, uh, Keith, why do you think it was necessary then to move on into quadraphonic sound? Well, I think there's uh, several factors here. One, of course, is that the uh, companies are looking for something different. And, uh, as ever. As ever, yes. But uh, I think a, a real attempt has been made by some people to generate realism in the home. In other words, we're trying to um, produce something which will uh, overcome the room acoustics. So, in other words, trying to produce realism, trying to put, put into the home the acoustics of the situation in which uh, a piece was recorded. Of course, this doesn't apply to a studio recording because the, the, the acoustics then have been damped out and the whole thing may have been made in several locations anyway. But I think for um, an orchestral piece, which has been recorded in a, a large hall, a town hall, something like this, then there is a real attempt by some people to reproduce um, the live acoustics in the listening room. Where do you think, though, in stereo, that this was? Do you think that this was lacking? I mean, you know, stereo was the big breakthrough. We were told, um, at you know, depths of sound, the the full atmosphere of the concert hall, as many of the stereo demonstration discs told us at the time. Do you think that quadraphony is going to add to this anymore? Yes, I think uh, we have found, and, and many people have found this, that once people have gone to quad, then they are very happy with it and will not usually revert back to stereo. And in fact, we'll play the stereo records synthesized uh, to give them a, a, an enhancement rather than just play them in stereo. As I hope to come on to later on, there are a vast number of problems involved in, in setting up quadraphonic equipment. Um, and also, it seems to me at the moment, uh, no one seems to be agreed on, a, on which system to use. I expect most of our listeners are, are very used to reading in hi-fi magazines either art, technical articles or adverts about such things as SQ, QS, CD4, and yet another one, UD4. Keith, can I ask you first of all if we can try and explain some of these terms? Um, but to start off by explaining what, we, what information, in fact, we've got to get on, on the disc, and let's talk about disc to start with. What information do we need to put on the disc in the first place for quadraphonic sound? I think, first of all, we've got to say that there, there's still only two walls to a groove in the disc. We haven't been able to manufacture discs with more than two walls. And so we've got to reduce the information into a form in which it will go onto two groove walls. And this has been done in two ways. Um, the people who have produced SQ, which is CBS in America, uh, and the proponents of QS, which is Sansui in Japan, have done this by mixing four channels into two and then recording those two channels on, on the walls of the groove, and then after doing that, one has to decode. That's the first thing. Uh, and those two s uh, initials, SQ and QS, stand for stereo quadraphonic and quadraphonic stereo. And they are called matrix systems because of the mixing uh, process. Can you just explain, um, when you say matrix system, can you explain how this matrix works? The matrix works such that if we take four cardinal points and, and the usual cardinal points are taken as left front, right front, left back and right back, then these are either recorded direct in uh, a studio, uh, but this is unlikely I think, um, or pan potted from a, a multi-mic uh, recording as, as normally done in stereo, and then fed out to these four corner positions for monitoring. Having got, uh, having decided which, which corners you want each instrument to come out of or what, what part of the sound system uh, to come out of the corners, 
then this has got to be mixed down in some way to put onto two channels, into two channels, onto the two walls of the disc. And this has to be done electronically. And it's no good just adding up these signals and putting, say, left front, left back and right back onto one wall and, uh, and another combination of three onto the other wall, because in this way it would be impossible to unravel this at the other end, having got them onto the disc, you've obviously got to unravel these four out of two. Meaning that really the, the, the stylus can only read um, right. two, can only read two, two pieces yes. of information. Two orthogonal pieces of information, that's at right angles, on the two groove walls. So the combination of these four input channels has to be done in such a way that it's possible to decode these. And so what we use is phase shifting networks, such that if we record, say, um, a left front signal, uh, and a, a right front signal and a left back signal on one wall, we arrange for the other wall to carry, say, the right back signal, but phase shifted by 90 degrees, say. And this means uh, f at one frequency a delay, a slight delay in the recording. And then in the decode stage, one looks for a difference between the signal in the right front, uh, the, the right hand channel and the left hand channel, and if a particular frequency comes up which has this delay or phase difference between it, then the decoder says, aha, this signal should appear in the right front, and then gives the appropriate uh, directionality effect in, in, this in this way. And so one has got a, a very complex series of equations involving phase shifting networks over a very wide frequency range so that decoders, and in particular logic decoders, can direct the sounds from the disc into the four cardinal positions. Now, this, in a basic matrix, uh, a fairly cheap decoder, leads us to 3 dB separation, which is not very uh, satisfactory for many purposes. One normally gets in excess of 20 dB, shall we say, on a normal disc. Meaning that perhaps out of the left front channel, you're also getting a lot of the right front channel coming out as well. In the case of SQ, for example, if a signal was supposed to come out of the left front, then some would also come out of the l left back and the right back. And but none would come out of the right front. One of the, the, um, the ideas behind SQ is that left to right separation is maintained as it would be in a normal stereo disc. And so therefore it's fully compatible in this sense. But, as you say, it appears out of two other channels. Uh, this also applies to the QS system, but it appears out of adjacent channels rather than the two rear when it should appear out of the front. But uh, it is separated by three decibels rather than, as I said, about 20 dB, which one will get on a normal disc. And so the manufacturers, the hardware manufacturers, have gone ahead to produce uh, what are called logic circuits to try and enhance this directionality and increase the separation uh, of the unwanted signals by more than 3 dB. And the, they have been successful. And both um, CBS, Sony have developed systems for enhancing SQ discs to give you in excess of 20 dB, and so have Sansui as far as the QS system is concerned. These give very directionality effects and are quite acceptable. So how does that uh, vary from QS? The, the QS system and the SQ system are both matrix systems, both of which um, are mixed down from 4 to 2 and use the conventional bandwidth that is required on a normal stereo disc. In other words, we, we're recording about, say, 18 kilohertz of bandwidth on both of these. So are we talking about um, what is virtually the same system, but which different manufacturers choose to call a different system? No, the two systems are different because the mixing down from 4 to 2 has been done in a different way. So in other words, if one plays a QS matrix disc on an SQ decoder, one will still get sounds out of all four speakers. They will not necessarily be the ones that were intended, and, and vice versa. If one plays an SQ disc through the QS decoder, one again gets a mixture, which in many cases can sound very acceptable, I might add, but is not exactly what the producer uh, and the recorder intended. Is there, any, is there any special type of cartridge that's required to reproduce this, or will any standard high-quality cartridge work? In the case of the matrix systems, one is not worried about excess bandwidth, and therefore one would normally not need a, a high-frequency cartridge, no. Yeah. Can we now move on to the CD4 system, which I believe uses a slightly different method of, of working? Yes, CD4 and UD4, for that matter, uh, re are extended-frequency range discs, 
and in the case of CD4, the disc frequency has been increased um, up to 45 kilohertz. Now, this is very much in excess of a normal disc, and I think one has got to give the Japanese credit for the development of this disc. It uses two bands. The bass band, which is up to 15 kilohertz, which is in fact lower than the normal stereo disc, and, and they have been criticised because of this. Um, so 15 kilohertz is the bass band. And then on top of this, uh, frequency or phase modulated, about a 30 kilohertz carrier is recorded another signal and this is uh, modulated between 20 kilohertz and 45 kilohertz. Now, let's, for example, if we, t if we take the left-hand wall of the groove, then the left-hand wall of the groove, say, uh, has got recorded on it, on the bass band up to 15 kilohertz, the sum of the left front and the left back. And the right wall has got recorded direct, the sum of the right front and the right back. So in the normal audio frequency range, that's the one that's normally picked up by an, an ordinary cartridge. One has got the sum of left front, left back, right front and right back. So there's all four signals there. In other words, mm. the thing is, is fully compatible with a, with a mono or a stereo player. But for quadraphonic reproduction, one needs extra information. And the extra information is recorded as a difference signal. In the case of one wall, it's left front minus left back. In the case of the other wall, it's, it's right front minus right back. And these are recorded on this high frequency band. And so after the, the, the signals come out of the cartridge, which has got to be a very high frequency cartridge, the signals have then to be demodulated. And then the sum and differences are taken between these uh, four signals. And one can arrive at uh, four separate output signals. And UD4, does that work in a similar way? UD4 works in a similar way, but not quite the same, in that uh, on the bass bands of the, the UD4 disc, which is again back up to 18 kilohertz, is recorded a matrix signal as the s in the same way as SQ and QS. But again, it's rather different. Um, <laughs> my mind's <laughs> beginning to boggle. Right, yes. One's got then the three matrices, SQ, QS, and the BMX matrix, which is recorded on the bass bands of the UD4 disc. So this means then with uh, a normal frequency range system and a BMX decoder, one gets the same sort of parameters for uh, decoding output as one gets for SQ and QS. In other words, 3 dB separation. Now, the proponents of this system, who are Nippon Columbia in Japan uh, and Dwayne Cooper in America, have suggested that one doesn't need the whole of the frequency range to give directionality. And this is, in fact, something that uh, Bloomline wrote in his 1931 patent. And so they have suggested that using a very much reduced frequency range, perhaps 3 kilohertz, one can get the directionality, which is apparent in CD4, or in the Logic uh, SQ and QS systems, without, in fact, having to record a full 18 kilohertz bandwidth. And so they have recorded extra signals, which I'd rather not go into in technical terms, because they require a complex mathematics, extra signals on the third and fourth channels, that is the... FM signals on the left and the FM signals on the right, which again, when combined like CD4 with the bass bands, will give you so-called discreteness. And perhaps I ought to emphasize that discreteness, as far as the CD4 and the UD4 discs, is, is not quite the same as being completely separate channels with the crosstalk being as good as one gets on tape. But is, is it restricted by, for yeah. example, the pickup cartridge? Just one point, and then I think we'd better take a break, because we've come out with an awful lot of information there, and I think a, a break may be called for. Uh, when you talk about discrete channels, uh, what do you mean? You can, I suppose one could define a discrete channel if you took a tape and had four separate channels on it, which represented the four, the front and back, the, you know, the two pairs of two channels for the front and the back. Yes, I think if we talk about discrete tape, one talks about, say, the Q8 cartridge which has got eight discrete tracks on it. And these are theoretically infinitely separate as far as the crosstalk is concerned. And, and although this has got signal-to-noise problems, this is a more discrete system than the disc systems. John, there's a point you wanted to raise from the last bit of discussion. Oh, there's lots of points. I thought that was a masterly <laughs> description of uh, you know, what goes on in this world of quadrophony, which is confusing for all of us. I mean, basically what you were telling us was why there's more wiggles on the, on the groove. Um, I asked Keith just now during that break whether the difference between SQ and QS was more uh, there for commercial than technical advantage. And, and you said to me, Keith, no, that wasn't so. 
and gave a figure of, was it 8 dB separation in one system? Yeah, I think that there are all these systems, I think we've got to say this, all these systems are a compromise in one way or another. Um, the people uh, that are the proponents of the matrix systems have compromised in, in, in extending, in keeping the bandwidth, but have d decreased the separation, which is inherently available, and, and I, had I, to use yes. logic. I, I then sort of threw it at you that surely the separation in the, between the human ears inside our nuts is not all that great. It isn't complete. It's only a few dBs, I believe. And you gave me the answer there that, oh, well, but that only degrades further and that the, the disc should be as good as yeah, it can be. Yeah, I think we've got to start mm. off with a disc which is as good as we can make it and then accept the limitations from there on because one's going to get degrading in the living room anyway. Certainly on the face of it, something that isn't trying to reproduce 45 kilohertz, is, well, certainly the disc is going to last a bit longer, you'd think. Uh, so one rather sort of favours the SQQS idea on that basis. You're talking there, John, about um, commercial interest uh, between the, the different systems, and I don't propose to go into that too much tonight because without talking to all members of the trade, uh, the battle to me seems endless at the moment. Which system is going to be used and which manufacturer is finally going to plump for a big system and, and, and get the whole thing going more so than it is? But, um, but Keith, compatibility seems a great problem at the moment. There are now what we can basically call, I suppose, two systems, but possibly, you know, four systems, really. Uh, how can we equip ourselves so that we can... Can we equip ourselves properly at the moment to, uh, you know, in case when one system's chosen, we haven't lost out right. with a lot of equipment right. that can't no, be you used? Don't, you don't want to buy discs now, which, which uh, mm. are going to be no good on yeah. the stereo I mean, system. For example, the, the, the system I was listening to this morning, which must have cost, I was think, in the region of between 1500 and 2000 pounds, mm will in fact work whatever system you know is is now used but i don't think that there are uh, the average high fines user certainly can't afford to spend that sort of money right so yeah. what can he do at the moment do you think well i think it's it's really a question of of not which system one wants to buy uh, i mean, think people are not buying the systems on technical grounds but they think they will buy them on the grounds of which artists they prefer to listen to and if one wants to listen to the artists on EMI and CBS, then one will go ahead and buy an SQ system. Uh, if you want to, uh, to buy the artists that are appearing on the, the, the labels which are QS encoded, for example, Pi, then you will go ahead and buy a QS system. So I, I don't think it's really a case of, of deciding on a technical system, this is for the enthusiast, and then going ahead and buying it and then looking for the disc. I think he's really got to say, do I want to hear Johnny Mathis in which case he's on CBS and therefore I'm going to have to buy an SQ system. But CBS also recalled uh, more serious, well, uh, you know, more classical music. Right, yes. So, um, you know, I mean, my musical tastes are very varied and I buy records from all sorts of manufacturers. So I'm, I'm still stuck, aren't I? Well, uh, again, there are different styles appearing already because I think in the very early days, uh, as has been said many times before, these systems have been forced upon the producers and the uh, recorders um, before the techniques of actually doing the recording yeah. w was, was, was worked out. Obviously the balance techniques are going to be something. I've seen some very funny photographs of uh, an orchestra laid out with a cluster of mics in the middle for quadraphony. You're, mm. you're not used to listening to the orchestra from the middle there unless it's a Stockhausen piece or something like that. He uh, put, puts yeah, them around in a ring so you, <laughs> the audience can't escape. Yeah, I think you've got to accept two points of view here. One is that we're trying to create realism, and there are a few people trying to do this. Um, I think EMI in particular, will find you'll find if you play their discs, will have less artificial sounds in the rear than perhaps some of the CBS discs, which have been deliberately done like this, John, where the orchestra has oh, been recorded, yeah. in fact, recorded with around the conductor. Just to make that, that you have something new here that's got to be made obvious, like the ping-pong that we had in the early stereo recordings, presumably. Well, uh, I'm not sure that is true of, of classical recordings. It's certainly true of the pop recordings, but I think some of the uh, composers and um, conductors have said, this is a new medium, let's exploit the written material in this new medium. Ping pong ding dong. <laughs> but do you think that a new art form really is growing up using, you know, recorded music as opposed to, you know, just, rec you know, using recording as an art form rather than yeah. setting microphones up in uh, to reproduce the sounds of a live performance? Yes, this, this is certainly happening. One's got these two things. One is to produce realism and the second is to, to try and use the medium to, to its big, biggest advantage. Mm. And the biggest advantage it's got is its directionality around the four sides.
the problems are phantom images mainly. That's the images in between the speakers. And there's a great deal of work going on, certainly in this country, to try and increase and, and to, to evaluate the knowledge we have as to where people think sounds are coming from. And in fact, the BBC are doing quite a lot of work on this. In, in the home, though, when we've perhaps, you know, someone who's got a, a quad system set up, does it present any extra problems in listening area and, and where you should sit between speakers, where speakers should be placed? It presents problems with uh, with the wife. Huh? <laughs> Am I tired of it? Uh, I, f I found it uh, very acceptable in many positions. There is really a very limited area in what when, in which one gets a pure quad sound field. And uh, despite what many people have said, I think you've got to get the system exactly balanced up if one is trying to get exactly what the recording artist wanted. But I think one gets very good reproduction from the sides and from the rear if one is prepared to change the balance a little bit or accept that one never hears a performance in exactly the right place anyway. So it's very synthetic and one's got to adapt to the medium, I think. Another thing I did want to ask you about, someone I was talking to this morning men mentioned uh, quasi quadrophony using uh, just one extra loudspeaker, um, taking it in a, you know, out of phase with the other two speakers. Can you explain how this works? Yes, I think uh, this is a system which has been ma mainly attributed to David Haffler in the States uh, and is, is usually known as the Haffler system. And it, uh, it's usually used with two loudspeakers in the rear, I think mainly because most rooms have got three, uh, four corners rather than three. But it, it takes the left and the right hand stereo signals and feeds the difference of these, left minus right or the right minus left, to the rear speaker. Now if we consider, for example, uh, a singer singing with a band. The singer is normally put in the centre of the sound field at the front. And this will mean that to create this illusion that the singer is between the two speakers, the two speakers have to be fed with the same signals, left and right are equal. So that if you take the difference between these two, and these two are equal, then that singer should disappear. Whereas the orchestra which is spread around the singer and the ambience from the hall which is different in the two speakers. If again, if you take the difference, that does not disappear because they don't cancel out. So, if you feed the left-hand signal to the left front speaker, the right-hand signal to the right front speaker, and the difference between these two to the rear, whether it's to one or two speakers, one loses the center image with, say, the singer, and one is left with the out-of-balance orchestral sounds and the ambience. And it leaves the singer firmly at the front, which is where I believe the, the singer should be, and, and fills the room then with, with an ambience, which, which is very good. And I, I, in fact, I must say that some of these, uh, some discs using the Haffler system sound far better than some of the Matrix discs. We've been talking about listening to quadruf quadrophony on um, loudspeakers. Keith, is it as, as easy to use headphones when listening to quadrophony? Well, if you want a specific quadraphonic headphones, then, then one can buy these from several sources, JVC important, for example, and the, there is a di distance between the front and the rear transducers of something like three inches, I guess. Uh, th now, this, if, if one is using a discrete tape, one can clearly hear a difference in direction, um, but with, with a matrix disc and with a disc which is mixed with much the same sound coming from the front as from the back, then there is very little difference in direction uh, and the effect is really lost. So really it's, it's only true I think for very discrete signals that one gets quadrophony with headphones. And, and heavy headphones as well I should think. Uh, yes, a little bit, yes. <laughs> okay, well we've talked at some length about some of the technicalities involved and I know there are an awful lot of people lined up to talk to us. So can we take our first call please and say good evening to the first person on Sounds Good tonight. Good evening. Hello, this is Andrew from Weir. Yes, um, Andrew, what's your I'd point? I'd like to speak to Keith about this quadraphonic. Um, I, I've got a B&O 1500 and I bought the two extra speakers with, and you buy a little unit called an ambiophonic. And you'd like to know what that is? No, 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 I've got it. I've got that unit. You see, no, what I'm saying is that I bought the unit and I, I plugged it in the way they said and the instructions and it wasn't very good well i altered the wires round the back and i've now got well well everybody thinks uh, i've got quadraphonic and i don't think you know you need to buy all this expensive equipment yes i think can many people <laughs> sorry 
Yeah, I was going to say, can you describe possibly what this ambiphonic system is? Yes, I, I think there are, there are very, very many ways of creating these two rear channels. Uh, the Hafler effect is one of them, and people like Bang and Olufsen have gone in to do this in another way. One of the problems with the Hafler system is that if one takes the difference between two signals which are approximately the same, one is left with noise, which is different on both channels. And so the signal-to-noise ratio of the different signal goes up quite dramatically. If one uses a phase-shifting network, which many of the commercial companies do, and I think uh, Bang & Olufsen do in their system, one can, can create rear channels which are lacking in this um, bad distortion which can be present in the half of the system and can give you very good um, surround sound effects, in other words, quasi-quadrophony. But there are many ways of doing this, and, and everybody chooses to do it in a different way. Yeah, so it is a, it's a quasi-system, it's not a true... Right. Um, what is as, just as important, though, in that quasi-system as a standard system, surely, is that the, your loudspeakers must be in phase with each other when you start off, otherwise you're going to get some very weird effects <laughs> indeed. And you'd have to do a check on each of your four speakers to make sure they all work together, all the cones go forward and backwards on positive and negative signals. And it's also important, isn't it, Keith, that the phase, phasings in the separate amplifiers mm. must be pretty accurate. It must be. Oh, yes, because uh, uh, otherwise one loses the phase differences in the chain of the quadraphonic system and one can then not decode properly. I think, I think if Andrew is disappointed with his system, he ought to make quite certain that his loudspeakers are all in the correct phase relationship to each other. Because it couldn't possibly work otherwise. Yeah. Well, I hope we've helped you a little bit there, Andrew. Well, I'd also like to thank for this evening's programme John Longdon, who's our Chief Engineer here at Radio London, and Keith Barker for coming along. The next programme of Sounds Good will be in a month's time, and so from all of us here on Sounds Good, I wish you all a very good night.